Hello, I'm Kathy with a K here in Honolulu, sometime radio broadcaster, and this is Hawaii POV. This better be politically correct. <laughs> and uttered. Michael W. Perry, a legend in our islands of broadcasting, both radio and television. I read the book, Perry on the Left, Price on the Right, 30 Years. You're the one who wrote it. <laughs> I'm the one who was campaigning for it. It was released in 2014. Larry Fleece wrote that, the guy who actually produced Hawaiian Moving Company, produced and directed Hawaiian Moving Company and all the Andy Bumatai specials back mm-hmm. in the day. Great writer, did a great job. Digging up the pictures was the hardest part of that book. We had to scrounge up pictures from everywhere. And of course, for the TV special that went along with it, mm-hmm. get the video. Actually, we enjoyed that. Coach and I loved that book. I thought, where could I begin talking story with you? My, <laughs> my goal was just I wanted to have a conversation, number one, because I've only really spoken to you in the halls. When you allow eye contact with uh, people. Which I, I forbid, <laughs> usually. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> in the halls here, because I know you from when I was small kid time hearing you on the radio. Anytime somebody turns on the radio anywhere in the world and here on the islands, you may be new to someone. And we're aware of that, actually, with the radio show. It's new people all the time who don't know what the heck you've been doing for the past 35 years and uh, don't know all the little traditions and mm-hmm. inside jokes and all that stuff. So every now and then we have to kind of break down and tell everybody, uh, by the way, this started... <laughs> back then, yeah. etc. You were born and raised in Michigan. Left when I was six. Actually, I was uh, raised uh, just outside of Washington, D.C., Arlington, Virginia. Mm-hmm. And uh, a high school was there. My dad was stationed in Washington. But I've been here uh, ever since the early 70s, since the Navy. 1972. Scary. Did some college, some college, and you were a professional. College radio. No, I, I read it was, you were paid, so in my no, mind, that's after, anytime. No, 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 that's after college. college. You start with college radio because you can be awful, and there's no one listening. It's fine. Okay. And then uh, I got a job, 9 o'clock, to, well, no, a board operator, the lowest form of human life in the food chain mm-hmm. of communication. If you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, worked my way up to doing the 9 to midnight show on a regular old pop station, rock and roll top 40 station, disc jockey by night student by day. What was your name when you went on air? Pretty much the same as it is now. Was it Michael Perry, Michael W. Perry, no, Mikey? They gave, they gave me the name. They gave me, the, they said, that's a great name, Michael W. Perry. That's what I wrote on my application to get a job. Mm-hmm. I was Mike Perry in the college dorm radio station, the college radio station. What format was that? It was anything you wanted because we couldn't afford a format. So it was whatever. I well, just played top 40. What was top 40 back then? It was like 1968. Uh, Mamas and Papas, Mm -hmm. uh, Still Beatles, Rolling Stones, and then some groups that never went to Tommy Rowe and Tommy James and the Shondells, you know, Motown, all the Motown stuff. Motown was big because I went to Michigan State, which is right outside of Washington, D.C., so we got great concerts. Were you into music? Well, actually, one of the things I noted was a mention of Floyd Kramer. Floyd um, Kramer, great yeah. country piano. I was really interested. Was that your hero? Is that yeah. your... I was in a band in, in school. I took piano lessons, took a band, I was in a band, played uh, keyboards. And Floyd Kramer, I always thought, man, that guy's good. He's a Nashville country piano player. Played on all the Chet Atkins records and all the, all the stuff back then. And then he became a solo artist. Yeah, incredible style. Uh, copied by everybody from Elton John on. Mm-hmm. A lot of people owe to Floyd Kramer. Great, amazing musician. Did you ever incorporate piano playing in your years of being on the radio? Of somebody, you know, singers like, let me accompany, you know, just to. No. Don't do you like. Play, do you still play now at all? Poorly. I peaked at 18, so it's been a while. Mm-hmm. I didn't actually have a band in college, I didn't have time. I was more interested in radio, and no, I've, I've never done anything with it other than to know when somebody is playing badly or well, mm-hmm. I can pretty much tell. Still, I play badly. <laughs> music is good. Uh, music knowledge is very good if you're in the radio uh, world because basically you're dealing with what people hear. And Aku had something. Remember Aku? 
Aku always said, you don't want to do two musics next to each other because you never know how it's going to come out. Always do music voice, music voice, music voice, music voice, mm -hmm. which makes an incredible amount of sense. Actually, he showed me a study from the University of Michigan that proved that. And he said he'd been doing it anyway mm -hmm. all those years just because it, it's how people perceive things. Two musics don't necessarily go together. Sometimes they do. Most of the time they don't. Does it have to be a separation with a voice or a jingle or a sweep or can it just be a gap of silence? Silence is good. Yeah. Golden. Which I, the irony of radio, we dead air is. Oh. Um, <laughs> Could sell. Dead air means just three seconds. Nothing. You didn't sell to a commercial. Ah, uh, that's just terrible. You can't do that. As memory serves me, his memory serves him better because he was there. I earned every <laughs> one of these gray hairs. I'm very proud of. Them. 1972, you were uh, hired at KKUA. Right. And uh, that was a top 40 station. Was that AM or FM? Which I. There was no FM back okay. then. Okay. Uh, there were FM stations, no one listened to them. There was only 17 stations on Oahu back then, as I recall. AM now, and FM? Yeah. You're, you're just, I just said there were no FM stations. <laughs> yeah, uh, F, there were a couple of FM stations. Nobody listened to them. Mm -hmm. This is before, and 72 is before FM. Plus, we only had half the FM dial until. I can't remember. Uh, it stopped at 98. Mm -hmm. There was nothing above 98 mm -hmm. on the dial. They wouldn't let us have it for some communications reason or the military or something. And so, no, it was all AM stations. It was K Point, Coral, and KKUA, and KGMB. You know who they are. Mm -hmm. Us. And uh, the KGU and the country station, Kahu. And that kind of thing. And they were all the top 20 stations. And then somewhere at number 21, number 17, I think it only went up to 17, was uh, some FM station. I don't know which one. CSEFTEL brought FM in. Uh, he so what does that mean as far as um, bringing that in? Because we're so demanding these days that Internet must be free. Wi-Fi is free. We can just have our own websites and well you had to sort of, of let things. people know that there's another dial because their radio has this thing that says FM on it and nobody used it back then in Hawaii on the mainland they got FM before we did uh, and they used it so CSEFTEL who owned KGMB back then says I think I'm going to I think I'm going to do this mm -hmm. he owned uh, 93 93 FM and he made it QFM and had a big contest. Do you remember? I listened to the new sound of QFM. You answered the phone. Phone rings. You answered the phone. People had actually phones at home with cords back then. This weirdest thing. And you'd answer your phone at home and you'd go, I, you wouldn't say hello. Yes. Don't say hello. Yeah. Listen to the new sound of QFM. And if you uh, said that, you won a gazillion dollars. I don't know how much it was. But that's how Cease promoted the first FM station, very successful. And we over at uh, KKUA on the AM dial were going, oh That's... no, what's this? Yeah. What's this fresh new hell? So uh, we- <laughs> There's another thing we have to incorporate? <laughs> <laughs> how are we going to work this in? Uh, so they, and after a while, of course, he sold 93, bought mm -hmm. 92, mm -hmm. and that's where we are right now. And uh, I, at one time, I was the program director. When would that have been? 19... Oh, right before, right before Aku died and Coach and I went on the morning show. About 1981, 82, I was the program director for both AM and FM, which was all on tape. 1972, higher at KKUA. Till 78. In the 80s, there was a television program called Hawaiian Moving Company. It was hosted by another longtime radio personality, Kamasami Kong, who's now in Tokyo. Actually, he did that in 78. 78. And uh, through 1980, it was a disco show. In 1980, disco died. It went underground. Hey. It sort of, yeah. <laughs> it died and went underground, both. And then uh, they, they approached me and said, we want to make this a new show. We want to keep what we have, keep the audience we have, keep the name we have, which I never liked, and keep, uh, keep it alive. Phil Arnone, who was a great, 
great guy. He's responsible for Checkers and Pogo. Aww. Do you remember Checkers and Pogo? Yes, oh, okay. yes. That's Phil's, Phil Arnone created Checkers and Pogo. Mm -hmm. And uh, all, he and Larry Fleece created all of the Andy Bumatai specials, All in the Family, um, the Rap Replinger specials, all those things. Everything was on KGMB. Everything. KGMB was it, was it the production company through there, or KGMB was the one who said, you know, we'll, we all, will air it? It was all kind of the same. Yeah. yeah. They produced or put it on. Mm -hmm. And around 1980, Disco died. They said, we want to keep it alive. Would you change... Would you help us change the format, become a host of a magazine show? And I said, sure, but can, can we change the name? Hawaiian Moving Company. I tried three separate times in 28 years to change the name of that show. Mm -hmm. Never happened. So you were able to change the oh, format, or yeah, how the people would format see changed. It. Yeah. Changed well. We became. Uh, that's the longest living show in the history of. When Why? did it go off the air? 2008. 2008? I think so. Wow. Yeah. It still may be on. People tell me that some of our old shows are on in foreign countries, Taiwan or something like that. Are you seeing any of the residuals? Are you wondering where the 17 cents from Taipei, the why you're... <laughs> the checks are flowing in. No. The Hawaiian Moving Company, by the way, just took off when Hawaiian Host sponsored it. Mm. It was uh, not uh, sponsored before that, except, as a matter of fact, we didn't have a budget. We'd have to hijack cameramen from out of the men's room and put a bag over their head and say, you're coming with us. And that's pretty much how we did the, the actual show. We just scrounged everything we could from about 80 to 84 when Hawaiian Host came to us and said, would you like us to sponsor you? And we said, yes. And they lasted, uh, well, the whole time. Yeah, money can really help <laughs> expand the focus a, and reach and hallelujah. topics. And a budget. No, it was incredible. That's amazing. I remember uh, a young man who was living on the Big Island. He moved here to work at our radio station. And he pulled me aside in the hall one day and said, I had no idea Michael W. Perry worked on the radio. I only knew, because they don't catch KSSK on the Big Island, but he and his family would always watch Hawaiian Moving Company. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Neighbor Island folks, really, actually, yes. I think they liked it more than Oahu folks because it made them feel like, hey, there's something about us. Yeah. There's something about everybody in the state of Hawaii because we were everywhere. We traveled all the time. That was a great experience. Television does not make you rich, but it sure makes you more well-traveled. Yes. And uh, I got to do things... A shy, kind of semi-introverted person would never ordinarily do. I still look back and go, wow, that was, what an incredible opportunity. That was in 1980. 80. First interview, Tom Selleck. Did actually, you feel super not sexy standing next to him? <laughs> actually, I didn't know who the heck he was. Uh, Magnum was just about to go on the air, and all I knew was the show, and we, we shot the interview right at the uh, Magnum Estate over in Waimanalo. Oh, cool. And there was uh, John Hillerman, who I actually was impressed with because he was on Blazing Saddles, the movie. And the two dogs were there, and some girl, and Tom Selleck, who I'd never, I didn't know him. He was actually unknown, mm -hmm. right? But was he charismatic? Say yes. Him and his mustache? Totally. <laughs> totally. You, you sort of went, okay, this guy's cool. You, you got it. And uh, it, uh, first interview, very first interview, and went on in 1980. Yeah. At what time did you move from KKUA to KSSK? 78. 78. Okay. Uh, a big format change for what was then KGMB. Mm -hmm. Earl McDaniel, the general manager, and Cease Heftel, the owner, uh, hired me from KKUA, where Ron Jacobs had just taken over. And okay. actually, it was a very successful radio station. They hired me to do afternoons. Aku was still on in the morning. Mm -hmm. And we were always plan. Larry and I were plan B. I didn't realize that mm. until quite a bit later. Like when Aku died. Because yeah. you were the whippersnapper from a top 40 station I doing was, wild antics on... I was Uncle yeah. Mikey back then. Yeah. Uncle Mikey. People and, will not understand if they are, like, they only know you <laughs> from KSSK with the news, the traffic, the 
entertaining, you know, phone calls and things like that. You were a wild and wacky well, DJ. Yeah, not wild and wacky. Well, well, I mean, there was an incident of streaking on Waikiki Beach. I'm just going to bring that up. Or was that just theater of the mind? I have, I know, I have no knowledge <laughs> of anything like that, except photographs exist, <laughs> so I can't really deny Redacted. It. Why? Oh, I don't understand. Everybody was, everybody did crazy yeah. things back in the 70s. Yeah. Uh, no, that was uh, well, my the opportunity. The flavor of the, that radio station versus um, KK Way versus when you came oh. over to Afternoons with KSSK. The idea was, I was getting, they changed the format of mm -hmm. KGMB, they made it more modern. They wanted somebody of my ilk, younger, to come over and sort of lend that uh, aura. Mm -hmm. For me, it was a chance to get out of rock and roll radio. Mm -hmm. I was getting to the awkward age where I had pimples and gray hair at the same time. You're not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. So it was an incredible opportunity. Mm -hmm. they, they gave me a new career. There are no rock and roll disc jockeys my age. Well, you're not doing rock and roll. You're doing adult contemporary yes. with some news and entertainment. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. We're, this show is, I'm such a dinosaur. This, is the, this show doesn't exist anywhere else in America. The mainland guys come over and they say, oh, we got to change. Now, wait a minute. Now, hold on. Yeah. And they listen uh, for a little while longer and they go, eh, leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Seems to be working. Well, it's worked for 35 years, so let's leave it alone. It's kind of cool that you're so well known, your face and your voice, that you're able to hide in plain sight. That's another thing about <laughs> living in Hawaii. Like, it, we do live on an island, and if you want to be found, that's easy. And at the same time, you can just really go about your life and not really be interrupted when you're shopping at Costco for really comfortable pants. Which I really <laughs> did. The, um, those are the best. Thanks for telling me that they were the right length. She's my fashion consultant oh, here the, at the radio Today station. is not a good day for that, though. So, uh. <laughs> that, uh, that was one of the things that I, I went into radio knowing, okay, people are going to know you, especially since I wanted to be on TV. I did want to be on TV. Mm -hmm. I ended up not liking TV half as much as radio, but I wanted to be on TV. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to try to do uh, Hawaii Five O and Magnum and Jake and the Fat Man and Island Sun and all these Weren't TV you on, Were you on the, all the I was shows? on all those yeah. shows. I, I did, back in the 70s, 80s, I did them all. Mm -hmm. And found out very quickly that as an actor, I am a terrific disc jockey. <laughs> and I, I became uninterested. It didn't take very long for me to not like it. Mm -hmm. well, and was I it, realized- Was it the hurry up and wait? Hurry up and wait and uh, you have to say the words exactly and I can't do that. I'm always- changing words to make them better mm -hmm. <laughs> right well, yeah. <laughs> and the writers really take take umbrage at that they don't like the fact that you're not saying the words exactly the way they wrote them and they will redo the scene and make you say it the other way mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't like that the thing that uh, a lot of people who listen to the just enjoy listening to the banter of their favorite disc jockey is not understanding that many times when we're lucky to hear someone speaking there is a lot of time and effort and research that goes into the preparation of a show especially what you do um, or most morning shows I, I would hope some people have like services that they can get a barter you know trade out and you know there's no. these formulated scripts so you how many newspapers or uh, every books? You know, every, do you? every magazine. I, you I have still a, have the same routine every morning? I've um, had the same routine since Wayne Harada asked me that question 25 years ago at least, mm -hmm. maybe more. I don't prepare in the morning because I prepare after today's show. Mm -hmm. I'll get ready for tomorrow's show. And that, that involves coming up with something interesting that I know will fit in. And then the news takes takes us where it's going to go, right? Mm -hmm. And the audience takes us where we're perhaps not ready to go. Coach and I used to go to Zippy's every morning and plan, today we're going to talk about the legislature. Today we're going to talk about traffic. And then the audience would yeah. take us 
on a very specifically the total, zip lane or something. Exactly, yeah. left turn, and they do whatever they wanted to do. And that we figured out, okay, ride the horse in the direction it's going. Let's go with that, and it was uh, it was obvious. Where were do. do you remember uh, any happy accidents became signature? Benchmarks. Perry on the left, Price on the right. First thing we ever said on the radio. It wasn't even stereo. It was monoral, for heaven's sake. <laughs> but it was like, Larry, Larry was, I'll get close to you. Larry, I was here, mm -hmm. and Larry was here. Now, watching us, it's not Perry on the left, right? But I just said that. It's Perry on the left. And Price on the right. Katouge. <laughs> That's good. And we said that for 34 years till coach retired. And, and there were all kinds of things. The posse. Yeah. The posse started. Yeah, how did, how did they become, was that a throwback to like Bonanza? Was that, you know, <laughs> and, and that's really dating. It, it all started, it, the posse started when we had, number one, we had the, uh, the, the cellular phone penetration had to be a certain amount. And we had more cellular phones per capita in Hawaii back in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, mm -hmm. than anywhere else in, in the country. So that helped. Plus, you have to have a, a good number of people listening. You have mm -hmm. to have a good market share. Those two things led to us doing this, where we find stolen cars. And people would call up and say, my father-in-law wandered off. He has Alzheimer's. We found him. Mm -hmm. And then gradually we said, you know, we have to formalize this. And we asked the audience, what would you call this? Uh, and uh, somebody said, the, I think I was already kind of calling it a bunch of things, posse mm -hmm. included. And they said, let's call it the posse. Never fear, the posse is here. <laughs> and that became the slogan forever. Did you ever think when you first got into radio that you would be partnered with someone? Because up until you and Coach got together in 1983, mm -hmm after the passing of uh, Hal Lewis, Akuhet Populé, yep. um, when that came together, even though you had chemistry, there was, there was obvious chemistry. Larry and I had never talked to each other, uh, basically. I mean, we've talked in the hallway. Mm -hmm. uh, we had never had a long conversation. I'd worked with him on a telethon once, uh, the Jello Jump. He was uh, co emceeing the telethon, and I was out there doing the Jello Jump, where you jump into a vile pool of really, really bacteria-laden jello. That was our only interaction, really. And it worked, actually. Mm -hmm. Larry, I'll get you. I think I still have that somewhere. I ended up in the, this horrible liquid, and I dressed in an old suit, so it would look like, oh, I ruined my suit. And uh, Larry, I'll get you for this. And I did. He had to sit next to me for 34 years. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, uh, you know, the idea is, okay, you got to, and we were plan B, as I mentioned, we were plan B for Earl McDaniel and Cease. They knew they wouldn't have Aku uh, forever. We were plan B. But forever was like decades. Oh, decades. It wasn't. A couple of decades. Yeah. It wasn't from like when you got hired in 78 and it was 83. 83 you right. know, that's. Uh, Five years. Yeah. Uh, so it, they knew what to do. Now. We, we always talked to Earl about how this was, and he said, this is like, think of yourself as an expansion team. You've got to, you know, so nobody's going to see you. Uh, the expansion team gets to work out all of the kinks. They, do, they run the playbook and everything in front of an open stadium. Nobody there. Nobody there at the stadium. They learn how to be a team. You guys are going into a full stadium, <laughs> never having worked together. Good luck. Bye-bye. That's pretty much what we got. And we were awful. The first couple of days was just awful. And I was wondering, how is this going to work? I, uh, the first thing that gave us hope was when the mayor back then, Eileen Anderson, briefly mayor in between Frank Fossey episodes, we were saying something and the mayor didn't like it. And we took a phone call. Hello? And this voice, you boys are really kicking me off. I'm, I am... Brush, I was brushing my teeth, and I heard you, and I didn't even have time to spit. She actually said that. Eileen Anderson. This is Eileen Anderson. <laughs> You're all wrong. And so we figured, wait a minute. The mayor is listening to this. Okay. We might be on to something here. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was fun. 
it got better. And obviously it got to the point where it's on automatic. It led to things like us getting bored on Saturday mornings. That didn't take long at all. 1983, I think I don't think we lasted a year on Saturdays. It was most Saturday mornings are like sensory deprivation. It's like you're in one of those warm water tanks, mm -hmm. no sensory stimulation at all. And so what you have to do is figure out how to not do that. We asked Earl, can we go to a shopping center, a restaurant, anything? He found us shampoos at the top of the Ilikai restaurant, held 90 people. We did our first show. We said, hey, it's kind of fun. He said, whatever you do, Earl said, whatever you do, you boys don't play live music there. It won't sound any good. So, of course, mm -hmm. we invited live musicians to come in and, and play. Of course we did that. And it was fantastic. That sounds like uh, the very early stages of nowadays online. There's that hashtag FOMO, fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. So that's what uh, the Saturday morning show really is. It, yeah, and the, the, the whole radio show is FOMO. It really is. I mean, that's mm -hmm. uh, until somebody actually made that a hashtag. I didn't realize I know <laughs> I, I was doing it, but we were for about uh, three decades. Mm -hmm. And the Saturday morning show became very good. We quickly quickly outgrew Shampoo's venue and moved to Hano Hano Room, which was great for 17 years. I think that was probably when the program peaked, I think, probably in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, we were getting television stars. This is before television stars became reclusive. And they, they started putting things in their contract, like we don't want to be on radio shows mm -hmm. or promote in any way <laughs> when we go to when we go to Hawaii, we used to get the top stars in America: mm -hmm. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Oprah, every conceivable sitcom star from back then. Is there anyone you were? I'm sure that you were impressed by that. You're like, I can't believe this person is sitting at our microphone. Two of the mamas and papas uh, were there. That's pretty good. Richard Harris got a standing oh, ovation. Wow. When he walked in, they, people loved him. Mm -hmm. um, the um, I mean, you personally, that you you admired their work or mamas and papas. Duffy Doherty, when I was at Michigan State, he was the football coach. Uh, so many players from Hawaii on the Michigan State team. This oh, is yeah. the championship Michigan State team, so they knew him, and I I was in awe. I'd, I'd never gotten within 50 yards of him. I'd seen him on the field. And, you know, genuflecting. Everybody genuflected to Duffy. He was the nicest guy. Um, Ellison Onizuka, I met the astronaut mm. before he died. Neil Sadaka was actually here in this room not too long ago. Several times. He's, he's been kind enough to, like, revisit. And there is an old-time musician, 50s, 60s, 70s. I mean, back in the Carol King, he dated Carol King. Uh, actually, pre Four Seasons, pre Jersey Boys, mm -hmm. fantastic. I've got a bit guy. of a crush on him when he comes. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He he speaks highly of of you too, Kevin. <laughs> Just wanted to let you know. Uh, when I think about uh, radio, I think about my first when I first fell in love with radio. Um, when you would listen to radio when you were a kid, um, I guess after moving away from Michigan because you were six. Uh, who were the disc jockeys that you might remember, or maybe the radio station formats that you would oh, I never gravitate to? I never forgot them. Uh, back in Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C., WMAL was Harden and Weaver. And that was the pair that I kept referring to in my head because I had never worked with a partner mm -hmm. until Larry. And I always, I, I thought it was remarkable how they did live commercials. They did them. Not quite as many as we do <clears throat> now, but I always liked the way they, they made fun of the client, mm -hmm. never the establishment. You can make fun of the client, never make fun of the establishment, the business. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were very loose about things, and they had sayings and, and uh, things they'd go back to all the time, mm -hmm. private in-jokes. And I always thought that's a good way to do it. Harden and Weaver. One of the Joy Boys on WRC radio back then, the Joy Boys, they had a half-hour show, and they were hilarious. 
And one of them was Willard Scott, who went on to incredible things on the Today Show and everything else. He was the first Bozo the Clown. Did you know that? And later, uh, Ronald McDonald. Did both. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there, those, were the, those were the two. And then I Boss Radio. When Boss Radio hit in the mid-60s, I always thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and then I got to meet Ron Jacobs, the man who actually created Boss Radio, and worked with him for a long time. Mm -hmm. Ron was completely insane and one of the biggest geniuses I've ever met. He created the whole, uh, although he never got the credit, Bill Drake got the credit for the whole uh, boss radio thing, KHJ, K KFRC, K, uh, I can't remember all the stations, but the whole Google Bill Drake and basically everything in there that says he did, Ron Jacobs did. Ron was the program director of KHJ in Los Angeles, biggest radio station, second biggest radio station in the country, literally made things happen. And I know this because I've seen all of Ron's memos <laughs> <laughs> and all the things that Bill Drake gets credit for, it was all Ron. What is Boss Radio? It was just this format, this tight, constant energy format of the mid 60s mm -hmm. that changed, it just changed radio. Radio was kind of stayed. Ugh. You know, this, this, every, anybody could be anything. You didn't have to have energy. You didn't have to be what we call tight, mm -hmm. where things are happening and you're paying attention. And uh, people would uh, talk in endlessly and not play a whole lot of songs. These guys played a lot of music, good songs. This is the mid '60s, great stuff out there. And they they were incredibly successful with this format wherever it went. And it still lives on. Actually, there's things that I take from that all that stuff back then and use every day. Where do you? see yourself continuing with this format and with KSSK? I mean, I have to do this more. <laughs> I am the most blessed guy in America. I've had the most incredible career with the most incredible people. And uh, I have a wonderful family and I keep going, okay, when will this end? So far, so good. And I just want to keep on going. I don't, people say, when are you going to retire? I don't know. Still fun. Yeah. I still like getting up at 3.30 in the morning. My wife would not like to have me around in the morning. Uh, I still like what I'm doing, so I'm going to keep on doing it. You wanted to be on the radio when you were very young. Yep, and, 10. And you're living that dream. Yep. There was a period when you had gone to college and gone into the Navy, mm -hmm. and in Guam it was a, a radio-free zone. There was no radio had until no you clue. came to Hawaii. Total isolation. So when you were in Guam, was there, were you thinking about, when I get out of the military, when I get out of the Navy? I loved radio. An alternate universe. It was radio-free radio, radio free Navy, that's for sure. I was doing nothing. I was a supply officer in the Navy. Here's, here's what I was thinking. My parents always thought I said, have a real job. So I was actually planning to get out of the Navy in 72, go get uh, my master's or something in something that was actually uh, respectable, right? Mm -hmm. So I was going to take six. I had a lot of friends here from the Navy, mm -hmm. a lot of friends that I had made here. I knew people here, and I thought, let me stay in Hawaii for a while. And I was single, heck, great, great freedom. So. Uh, I thought, wouldn't it be nice to be on the radio while I was there? And sure enough, I get this job at KKUA. And well, I how think, long were you on island before that happened? Was it a matter of weeks or months? Oh, no, I had the job. I came and talked to two people. I talked to Tom Moffat and I talked to the program director at KKUA. And uh, Moffat had something, but not until February. And I said, well, I'm going to need something in November. I get out in November. Mm -hmm. Uh, he said, I'm, well, I can't help you in November. So I went to KKUA, and they hired me right then for November. Uh, okay. And then I started doing this, and it, afternoons, actually, I started in the evenings, and that lasted about a week. And then they put me on afternoons, and I thought, this is incredible. I'm doing what I want to do, and they're paying me for it. And I enjoyed my time there. I, I still have friends 
from from back then, and it was going to be a six month episode in my life before I went on to do something respectable. Well, here we are, forty five years later. Next month it will be forty five. In December, December twenty seventeen is forty five years in Hawaii. November, actually, it's Thanksgiving time. Oh, yeah, it's all, we're almost here. Happy almost anniversary. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> 45? So many people have so many dreams of what I want to do when I grow up. Yeah. I want to be a firefighter or a pilot or a doctor or a dog walker. And your number one with a bullet was to be a radio disc jockey. I thought for a while, uh, I thought psychiatrist might be interesting, except you have to talk to crazy people. I found that out. Uh, being a musician, I actually thought that's why I was uh, such a fan of Floyd Kramer. Could I do that? I actually thought of going to Vanderbilt instead of Michigan State because it was in Nashville. I liked country music. Um, I thought I could be a studio musician or something like that. But number one was always radio, not TV. Didn't want, didn't want to be on TV. I knew I should probably do that just career-wise, but radio. Always. Did you always have the voice. As I listen to you, I'm like, that is Michael W. Perry that I would just hear on the radio. Warm, friendly tone. It's just, no one sounds like Michael W. Perry. Like every market has their... There's somebody who sounds... Their, yeah. yeah. I hated my voice when I was 13, 12 or 13, mm -hmm. and my voice was changing, and it was very... I always thought it was really hard to listen to. <laughs> And probably was back then, and then it just got deeper, and this is it. This is just what happened. No smoking, no hard drinking. I gave up smoking when I was 11. One lucky strike. That's all it took, me and my friend Paul, out in the park. Yeah, that was the, that was the end of that. Uh, no no hard whiskey or anything. It's just this is what, what you see is what you get. That's amazing. What you hear is what you get. Yeah. All the, the research you would do and the way you would set up the hour so you would have something to fall back on and just a preparation. Well, these days I'll get good at it. <laughs> <laughs> if, if only everyone had that goal. <laughs> that's, that's more than um, I could possibly ask for. The one thing that did stand out was about Floyd Kramer. That was a very interesting specific very specific i liked him uh i liked his style i imitated his style i never wanted to perform i hated recitals i hated because uh, when you take piano you have to go to the recital uh, hated it uh i don't like remember now i sort of threw in there just very quietly that i am a shy introverted person because mm -hmm. i am and I don't like performing. So God's little joke on me was, you don't, huh? Guess what? Guess what you're going to be doing all your life. At least I didn't perform piano because I can't. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, live shows. Do you know how many radio stations do live shows in America? It's like very zero. Few, yeah, very few. It's yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, doing the, 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 the Saturday morning show. Started, we were doing 50 a year. That turned out to be... Excessive? Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> we like the weekend. Fifth, now, remember, there's 52 weeks in a year. Yeah. So you would only have, what, Thanksgiving and you got maybe it. Christmas? That was it. Those were the two we took off. And then we figured out, okay, for, for everyone's sake, we better start taking some, some time off here. And n now we have, of course, cruises... So we're doing more and more live audience shows. Nobody does live audience shows. Some of our group here does because of this, this room here. This gives everybody the opportunity to do music it. Hall. Yeah, music hall. And that's a good thing, but nobody does that. And here I am, the guy who doesn't like to be in front of crowds, especially when they're all looking at me, taking, taking care of business pretty amazing. God has a sense of humor. Well, that gets me to thinking how everyone, since you've always been uh, going by Michael W. Perry, 
and there are individuals in broadcasting where they have a moniker on air, but that's that's who they are. It's like a like 50 Cent, the rap artist. That's who I am on stage. But when I'm not on stage, I'm this person. Mm -hmm. Michael W. Perry, are you very different from when you're on the radio and when you're doing events to when you have your off the clock? Well, I'm different. Papa now. It's grandkids, mm -hmm. right? Hi, Papa. I love being called Papa. That is so cool. And uh, my kids could probably tell you awful stories about me because I, I was very much into my career mm -hmm. back then mm -hmm. and probably to the de detriment of the kids. They don't, they tell me no, they tell me, no, you were, you were okay. Yeah. And Vicky says, you were pretty acceptable. Mm. <laughs> All right. You were I'll average. take that, I'll take that. You're really mediocrely <laughs> average. <laughs> you showed up. <laughs> I did. Uh, and, and no, it's, uh, I, I do like privacy, I like relaxation, mm -hmm. and I enjoy being around the people when I'm around them. Mm -hmm. I like the cruises. We have the most insane cruises because of the listeners. They love doing this, and I love the fact that they love it, so we all hang around and, and joke around and everything. And I have a great time, and then I go home, and I'll just be my myself by myself for weeks Minutes. and weeks and weeks. <laughs> yeah, well, I wish I wish it was weeks and weeks. Yeah, it's an uh, interesting life. This is uh, this is really not what I ever expected, but it sure is great. Yeah, it's. I feel so strange to pose the question of like what it's like because that's that's who you are, you're seeing your life and experiencing your life yeah, nobody, as it is. There's no off or on switch. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is just, I'm sorry, this is what you see. You, this is kind of I'm like. I'm very disappointed. <laughs> you, want, <laughs> you wanted so much more. <laughs> this is like. Dance, oh, monkey boy. <laughs> <laughs> this is like us talking in the hall. Uh, oh, it's just more of this. No donut box. Exactly. Every, they like me for my pastries. <laughs> <laughs> From Zippy's every morning.